session. Uh, our speaker will be uh, Manfred Wormuth from Google Research, and he will be presenting a Bayesian probability calculus for density matrices. Okay. Uh, thanks, Tom, for inviting me. Um, so I will talk about how we got there. Basically, we used to reason with probability vectors. In quantum physics, you reason with density matrices. And I claim that we have a base rule for density matrices. So I have lots of pictures. So hopefully, I'll stay at a high enough level to explain it. So where do I come from? I come from machine learning, where you have a bunch of models, I, experts, and then you maintain a weight vector on those experts. So your new weight is the old weight times e to the minus loss in the current iteration. If your loss is very large, your weight goes down by a multiplicative factor. This is a positive factor. If it is small, uh, then it uh, goes up or, or depending. And we, we always keep normalized weights. Okay, so if you're not familiar with this, there's a special case that you are familiar with, which is Bayes' rule. Bayes' rule happens when you have your loss have minus log the conditional probabilities, data likelihoods, then, and eta is one, then this is pulled down and it becomes this. And this is the normal base rule. Okay. Now, in machine learning, we're very much interested in also how to motivate the update. What's the measure of progress? What's the regularization? And it turns out base rule, the regularization is a relative entropy, or it's based on the max end principle. And I'm going to generalize all that. I'm going to use the quantum relative entropy to develop a new rule. And it's kind of a wild ride. But I'm talking about ba very basic things. I'm not talking about graphical models yet. I'm talking about how would you define conditional probabilities? How would you define the Bayes rule when you have density matrices? Okay. Good. So in machine learning, we ran into density matrices because we want to keep track of subspaces. It's a little bit complicated to explain. It, you run into that when you want to learn principal component analysis, then you want to have the, the, the subspace with the largest variance. And there we ran into an update, which was old density matrix, take a matrix log, subtract the loss, the gradient of a loss or the loss, and then matrix exponentiated and, and normalize, and that's your new density matrix. So we ran into this density matrix parameter, and then we asked ourselves the question, what corresponds to Bayes? And then we ran into a certain update that is interesting. Okay, good. So I'm gonna visualize things a lot. I'm gonna visualize symmetric matrices and so forth. And I use these plots. Um, you have a symmetric matrix or a positive definite matrix. And uh, you multiply, this is the unit sphere. I can only plot it in two dimensions for now. And then this point is S times U. Okay. That's how I visualize the metric matrix. And of course, the eigenvalues, then this is a straight line, right? Because you have this. They're the axis of the ellipse. Now, there's a very important one, which is the degenerate ellipse. We call it a dyad. Uh, I don't work with ket symbols. It would be ket times ket transpose or one of those, right? It's an outer product, UU transpose. It's, you have one, it's a density matrix, a degenerate density matrix with one direction where it's one, the eigenvalue is one, and all the other eigenvalues are zero. That's sort of the, the notion of a state, you'll see. So now let me give you a big picture, the way I was putting this together. You have real vectors. Then you take um, coefficient vectors times unit vectors, right? And that becomes a vector. In symmetric matrix, you take eigenvalue times uh, times these dyads or 
linear combination of dyads. Okay. Maybe they are joint? Uh, yes, it's a joint. I, I gave this talk to machine learners. So you have to replace a joint, uh, uh, transpose with a joint. Uh, you have to replace uh, symmetric matrices with Hermitian matrices, all of that. There's no difference. So I, I sorry, I didn't change my slides for this quantum thing here. Sorry. So now for probability vectors, you have weights times the unit vector. And now these are mixture coefficients, they're non negative and sum to one. They're still vectors. Okay. And then for density matrix, you take a mixture of dyads. And I have pictures of this in a moment. Okay. So that's sort of the overall picture. <coughs> And uh, we're going to argue today, of course, that density matrices are generalized distributions. That's, of course, boring to most of you, but I don't know. I just go over it again. So that what's central very often is the, the basic case, this case and this case, is a special case when you replace your unit vector by EIEI transpose. In other words, instead of writing writing things as vectors, I write it as a diagonal matrix with a fixed eigen system. We do that a lot, okay? That's sort of the general thing. Okay, so now I've got to talk about conventional and generalized probabilities a little bit. So the elementary events in normal probability theory are units. I mean, in a finite case, I could do this whole thing with continuous case, but it's just not the point. So assume you have a hundred very a hundred elementary events, and then the elementary event would be a unit vector, a unit. Or then, if you write it as E I E I transpose, it looks like this. Pictorially, it's the axis, fixed eigen system. Okay. So in the general case, the dyads can be in any direction, anything with unit on. Okay. Those are the dyads. And we prefer to use, I prefer to use these dyads instead of the unit vectors. Okay, so now what is an event? Again, I already talked about an elementary event. And then an event would be, you have a U, U transpose, and then here you have a subset of the eigenvalues that are, not, that are one. If you Look, the normal probability theory would be this would be identity. It's just a subset of elementary events. Okay. So you can write it, of course, using a sum of diets. Good. Now, a density matrix is the same object except the eigenvalues in here, they're non negative and sum to one. Right. Or you write it as a mixture of diets. So if you would want to do graphical models with density matrices, this would be your basic object, I claim. So if you write a mixture down, and the dimension here is two, and you write down three mixtures, you can write it as a matrix. This is a positive definite matrix. And plot looks like this, and it decomposes into dimension many eigendiads. Okay, so now symmetric matrices, <clears throat> symmetric positive definite matrix, you can view them as covariance matrices. That's kind of curious. I don't know why this is the case, but it just happens to be. There's a cost vector, and then your matrix would be this covariance. And now the interesting thing is the variance along a vector U, which would be this object, happens to become U covariance, U transpose covariance matrix U, or you can write it in very different ways. This way you can write it as a trace, right? So that's gonna be the assignment of probabilities. Sorry, I'm in the way. Okay. I can plot this. So here's the origin. Here's the unit ball. Here is the, the density matrix viewed as an ellipse in red. And then the dot product, the probability assigned to this particular direction happens to be the blue one. 
right? it's the variance. You get these beautiful plots. Here are some two dimensional ones. And the curious thing about these things is that if you take the probabilities, these are the probabilities, right? Uh, the probability assigned to u1, which is the same as the probability assigned to minus u1. Um, if you take these probabilities and you take two orthogonal ones, they sum to one. In three dimensions, whatever, however you, you, you rotate this, I, I don't know how to do this. The physicists know how to do this, sorry. Like this, right? Where, wherever you rotate this, um, the three sum to one. And that's a consequence of Gleason's theorem and so forth. We'll see in a moment. Actually, here it is. Gleason's theorem says, whenever you have some kind of a function of unit directions to probabilities between zero and one, such that if you take an orthogonal, orthogonal basis, it sums to one, then when the dimension is larger than three, the object has to be described using this density matrix. That's the reason theorem. So I don't know, uh, the proof is a couple of pages, but I don't even understand the proof, but I just took it for given. By the way, this is joint work with uh, Dima Kuzman, very smart PhD student in Santa Cruz, and out there, he's now also at Google. Now, this orthogonality, this orthogonality gener generalizes this jointness. When things are in the same eigensystem, let's say I, I take a dot product between two matrices and they're in the same eigensystem, then this dot product being, this trace being zero corresponds to the, the vectors, these two vectors being disjoint. So view orthogonality is somehow a, general, a, a fancy generalization of disjointness. When you're in the same eigensystem, it becomes disjointness. But when you're in, when the when the two objects are of different eigensystem, it's of course much more sophisticated. Now, what's this trace that we use often that becomes our dot product? In machine learning, you always have to have a dot product. Usually, it's dot product between vectors. Now we have dot products between matrices. So, what's that? So, if this is one of those event matrices, which was a um, symmetric positive definite matrix with some zeros and ones along the diagonal. Then you can write this trace in various ways. One way is you can write, pull out a probability, um, which comes from the density matrix, the eigenvalue, times the variance along a certain direction. So it's an expected variance. You can also have, you can also see that the trace acts like an expectation in some sense. You have a random variable, which is a symmetric uh, uh, matrix. Then you can expand over the sigma i's. And then this is again a probability via this rule here. I said, whenever you take ortho, when you ever expand the probabilities over an orthogonal basis, they sum to one. Here an orthogonal basis that sums to one and then times an outcome. So it becomes an expected outcome. In quantum physics, you use measurements. So in my notation, I'm showing this to contrast what I do is different. And I don't understand uh, fully everything, of course. Okay, so you have a mixture state. That's your density matrix, your posit positive definite density matrix. And then you have an observable. And then after the measurement, you collapse into one of these dyads or a mixture of those dyads. And this particular dyad happens with this probability. So you go from here to here, and this is your successor density matrix. And there's also an outcome and the trace is an uh, expected outcome. Uh, in my base rule, we are not going to collapse. 
But nevertheless, it's the natural thing that corresponds to reasoning with density matrices. So that's what I want to get feedback from, from you. You'll see. Okay, so more pictures. So the question is, what does it all mean? So first, I'm now going to explain the normal base rule in pictures. You have some models chosen with some prior probability. And then a datum is generated is a data likelihood. And uh, then this would be the, the theorem of total probability, uh, which sits down here. And uh, the base rule is this, you take prior times data likelihood over normalization in pictures. So this is your prior, this is your data likelihood. Okay, this is the first posterior. So I multiply this times this, this times this, this times this, I normalize and I end up with this. Notice that there was a high likelihood over here. So this bar is pulled up. And if we keep on iterating that, it's gonna go up higher and higher. Second time, apply the same data likelihood. Third time, fourth time, you see? So essentially, this is a soft max. View base as a soft max. Because if you would iterate it, you would go to the maximum likelihood. But it's soft because there's a relative entropy there as a regularizer. You will see. Yes? Do you want us to think of this as seeing? Should we think of this as seeing the same data point four times, or is it just abstractly? No, no, no. It actually is the, the exact plot. And I will do another visualization in a moment. And I will show you what my quantum base rule is, and it's related. Okay, the quantum base rule for now, what happens is it happens to be a density matrix, which is red. A data uh, symmetric data likelihood matrix, which is this. Then uh, you take a matrix log of both. You add, this is commutativity. You will see that in a moment. Then you matrix exponentiate. Now to show you in pictures what happens when you have iterate that matrix, that update. It also does a max and it goes to the maximum eigenvalue of this matrix. Go back. What happened? So you see, initially the posterior wasn't aligned with a maximum axis, but it's gradually moved to the maximum axis of the data likelihood matrix. In the diagonal case, you just go to the maximum. Now you go to the maximum eigenvalue. And this is just, a, this, this operation here is just mathematically totally beautiful and puzzling and it hits the spot um, <laughs> in many ways, okay? So that's what I will try to convince you. Everybody understand? So it's this, if you, if you remember one thing in this talk is view based this way as a soft max, and this is a soft max eigenvalue calculation. That's your question. Yes. What is the data likelihood matrix? Uh, it's a, a symmetric matrix. I will talk about that in a moment. What these things are. We back engineered it or everything, right? But then it somehow fit. Okay. So now I show you what an evolution of this iterative update work works, does in a different way. Um, Imagine you have three, three experts, one at concentration 1.4, 0.3, a little bit less than 0.3, and a very small one. And the fitness vector, the likelihood vector is of this one is 0.84, the factor by which you multiply this one 0.85 and this one 0.9, this 0.7. So when you iterate this one times, two times, three times, this one is pulled up. It, it is beaten by 0 0.5, 0 0.85, because it's a little bit larger, but then the 0.9 comes in and beats them both. Okay. Now, this is the most difficult plot in some sense. What I do now is, 
instead of I do it in the matrix case uh, here, here, the concentration vector and the fitness vector, they are in the same eigensystem. And then this calculation here is rather slow. But if they are offset, if they rotate it a little bit, it happens faster. It, everything is, happens faster. If I extend to positive and neg negative infinity, this is the diagonal case. And this is the case where you have an additional rotation in there. So somehow the, the base rule when they are off, okay, when you in pictor pictures, when I wanna do this calculation and uh, the red and the green matrix are in the eigen, same eigensystem, then their computation goes the slowest. If they're slightly off, then I home into the maximum eigenvalue faster. And that's the promise for me as a machine learner of the quantum. I, I kind of go around things and I converge faster and we are fascinated by this. <laughs> yes, I can repeat what you said, okay, what I said. If red and green are in the same eigensystem, then this iterative process of going to the maximum is slow. If, however, they're in a different eigensystem, so these are rotated, red and green is the axis of this is this, and the axis of red is this. If they're not in the same, they don't have the same axis, then the maximum calculation is faster. Puzzling. And that shows up here in these two plots. Okay. You still have everybody? everybody? Okay, good. It's an unusual talk, I apologize. So uh, normal Bayes rule, you can write it, we're gonna write everything diagonally, right? So it's the data likelihood, and now that posterior, prior data likelihood normalization. What that means in machine learning would be you start with a prior, then you have a data likelihood. Oh, it stretches this a little bit longer. The posterior goes a little bit bigger in this direction. Here, another further stretch. Oh, wow. Now it goes fatter this way, it gets a little fatter. I react to, you see, this is online learning. That's my background. Now, when I do the, what I call quantum base rule, but when I send, Oh, I sent this to a, a journal and we called it quantum base rule. And I, I got such complicated reviews about, you know, philosophizing in so many different ways. It was just amazing. Um, quantum kind of makes people's heart pulse. So then <laughs> we were a little bit more careful with our language. <laughs> okay, so now in the situation is, you have a little bit of a rotation, you see, and it reacts. And then here it reacts back and it reacts back. You see what I'm saying? So that's the kind of thing we're interested in, these updates and what's the regularizer and so forth. Okay. So, so far I have a nifty generalization. Yes. <clears throat> so do, do these updates commute? Yes, you, 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 you will, uh, commutation is very important. Uh, you will see it. First of all, when I multiply two matrices, they don't commute. So that's the first thing I have to solve. Right. And then, yeah, okay, you, yes, good point. You, you were getting there, right there. So here's your, my update. So this is symmetric positive definite. It doesn't even have to be normalized to one. Well, the eigenvalue sum to one, okay? Symmetric and the eigenvalue sum to one. And then here, I just have to have symmetric positive definite. Typically, the range is bounded. But you can also normalize when the range is not bounded. OK, and now the picture goes like this, you see? Uh, you start out with symmetric positive definite, symmetric positive definite. Then you take logs, you get symmetric. Then you get addition. That's the commutativity, essentially, you will see in a moment. And then you matrix exponentially, you get symmetric positive definite. Divide by one, you get a dense in the matrix. So it is, in some sense, a generalization of an intersection. You will see this pictorially in a moment. And um, when I multiply 
two vectors and com to compute a, uh, a to compute the base rule when one of the guys is zero it's zero and only in the, when in the support if you intersection the, the 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 posterior lives in the intersection of the support right only this guy is non zero and this happens also for the other base <laughs> rule log a log b so a a is red green and the result lives in the intersection this here okay okay um let me skip well okay let's talk about that too okay so i was here i was interested in traces when the two guys have the same eigensystem then there's a lot of interaction in the dot product when they have the different eigensystem then this measure this matrix the density matrix doesn't even see much of these two it cannot distinguish between this and this as long as they have the same trace it's the same the result is the same so when this one is in our basic eigensystem and this one is hadamard in some sense you don't see it the dot product doesn't see it right this is fundamental in all of quantum computation now here's a lee trotterization of this product you can write this as a limit of a to the n b to the n power n very fascinating and if you write this limit as a circle dot then the base rule becomes this the quantum base rule it's just a funny product now this trotterization i was fascinated by that so we plot <laughs> we visualized it so if this is a, a two symmetric matrices then if you take that product it might not be symmetric and it also is not positive definite you get these negative parts but if you take the circle dot it actually is symmetric and you see this here's a b b a a a half b a half a a half b a half and then b a half a a half b a half a a half they get this gets smaller and more symmetric and if you do it infinitely often you end up with this there is another trotterization which i only discovered later where you pull one half out then the symmetry part is already taken care of but so it, as you go on you get more and more symmetric and more and more positive definite you can do it with rabbits <laughs> actually i grow rabbits um uh, so this is a b this is this famous Stanford rabbit, B, A, and they look different. But if you do A a half, B a half, and so forth, they already look more and more alike and you do it very slowly, then it becomes commutative. Right, you ask that question, commutativity. So this is about commutativity. So there's many properties, the intersection properties, commute, uh, relates to determinants, okay. Now, some other basic things. Theorem of total probability. What's the theorem of total probability? It's even before Bayes' rule. You have, this is your whole space. You want to look at the event Y, and this is a subsection into different areas, depending on the models. And then the probability of this is equal to the sum uh, you know it's like the conditionals are summed up right pmi times uh which is this area times how much in that area is y it's this area times how much in the area is y it's this area times how much in the area is y summed up and then you get total probability okay so we generalize this using our operation it becomes an o dot and a trace and we generalize the whole calculus 
but I don't know whether it's real. That's my last open problem. You will see in a moment. That's why I'm, I'm talking here. I hope somebody will prove it to me. Uh, is there a real phenomenon that does it? So you, you have the theorem total probability. It's still upper bounded by traces. There's some famous inequalities there. And uh, yes. So now we were fascinated because we're machine learners, we're online learners. Uh, what is the uh, what is this generalization too? And then everything we looked at generalizes. The fundamental thing of Bayes is um, you want to approximate your p of y by p of y p of m i of a particular model times the data likelihood. That's a lower a lower bound. That corresponds to the map estimator. You take minus log in front. The minus log of p of y is equal to um, the minimum of the minus log of the prior probability minus the data likelihood. This is sort of the fundamental bound that you will overdo. You, you have a fat solution. You throw everything away, and, you and then you have products, and then the logs become sums. That basic calculation, that kind of bounding style that you do in Bayes a lot happens again for this case. Uh, you have to use a few inequalities. And again, here is sort of uh, the, the prior data likelihood. And you have to minimize over direction as well. So it goes on and on and on. OK. Machine learning. We don't just care about the update. We want to have what is the regularization? What holds the update back? And that here is a relative entropy. So I explained we derive all updates, usually in terms of a minimum of a regularizer, often a breakman divergence plus eta times loss. Okay. And um, we're going to explain Bayes' rule this way now. When you put your relative entropy, you get the exponentiated gradient algorithm. When you put Euclidean distance squared and minimize, you get gradient descent back prop. Okay. So what do we, how do we derive base rule, normal base rule? Mixed uh, relative entropy to the prior minus an expected log likelihood. If you said eta to infinity, which means, which corresponds to you iterate the thing very often, or then you listen to that loss a lot because this one is wiped out. And then you just go to the maximum direction. And this eta controls the softmax. Um, and you can solve this. You add a constraint, a Lagrangian, that the, the coefficients have to sum to one, and then you do a little calculation. Then you get Bayes' rule with an eta parameter, which is a time parameter. If you said eta to one, you get the normal base rule. So does everybody understand this? So I, I'm interested in deriving the updates. Why? Because this is now my regularized. It also becomes my measure of progress. It becomes my inertia term. The bounds will, when you prove things, this will be central in, in, the, in the proofs. So I need to know the inertia term. And the fundamental thing is nature, when it uses base rule, implicitly works with entropies. Why? I don't know. I will show you later a way of running Bayes' rule in your kitchen with 10 to the 15 variables if you have a PCR uh, little thing. But um, that's all you need. Uh, but I don't know whether the quantum Bayes' rule is real. OK, so that's the update. Now, you can also view, take the relative entropy apart and have two terms. This is the data likelihood. And this is the initial data. And then it becomes, the regularizer becomes a re an entropy. So it's the max end principle. It depends on what you like. The max end principle or the minimum relative entropy principle. It's, it's Kulbach versus Jaynes. How do we get up with a quantum rule? Well, we plug in the quantum relative entropy, also sometimes called the von Neumann entropy. And it has various other names. It was a Japanese guy, I forgot the name. And, um, and then you have to have a fancier mixture for the, log uh, for the expected log likelihood. You do the same thing, 
you get the normal base, the base rule that I had in eta with when you use eta equals one. Is that clear? So that's how you can derive these updates from first principles, from, from, from you know, look, all natural distributions are derived using this kind of principle, minimizing entropy subject to constraints. The Gaussian is something, the you know, exponential distribution is something. It's very, very, very fundamental in probability theory. And we just use the same thing to get a quantum base rule. Okay. Yeah. You can also split off the quantum entropy, and this is the initial data and the data, uh, like, uh, the data likelihood. Good. Now, where do those conditional things come from? <laughs> I think it's very complicated. And this is um, kind of a, a, a horrendous paper in the sense that I've done this a while back, uh, but if I really want to understand the details, I have to study it, even though it's my own paper. <laughs> so you have to, uh, in general, whenever you have to, uh, have a, a Y space and an M space. And in the binite case, it's very simple. The elementary means for the cross space is AI times BJ. It gets much more complicated in the quantum case, what I call quantum case, uh, because you can, have you can have entanglement. The upshot is, and then there's lots of these traces. You get rules of the following type. And there's about 20 of them. Um, this is marginalization. You use partial trace. Okay. Uh, here is a, another Bayes rule that already was develop, developed by Cerf and Adami. He's, they were at Caltech. I think they're physicists. We found their rule as a special case of our, of our calculus. Um, this is the theorem of total probability. These are the flavors of the things you get. This is another base rule, the base rule that I showed you. That I, and there's another one here. So we have a whole calculus. So I claim that this is the right calculus to use. It's complicated. Maybe it can be simplified and so forth, but um, it's kind of curious. So we, we maintain uncertainty about the direction of maximum variance using a density matrix. We updated, we, we developed an update, generalized the conventional base rule. We can motivate it using a max n principle and we developed the calculus. Okay, we used this, is there one for other matrix classes? We used, we used already this calculus in rudimentary ways only. We didn't need fancy calculus, but we used the density matrix as a parameter for PCA, but we're looking for other applications. Now, here's my open problem one. I have two open problems for you. <laughs> open problem one is, is it real? Now it turns out normal Bayes rule is real in the following sense. Assume I have 10 to the 15 RNA strands in here, different RNA strands in here with certain concentrations. And I want to select a strand that attaches to a surface of a protein. This is kind of drug design application. You need that. You need to have the, uh, first you need to have attachment. Okay, so you tip your sheet of protein into the soup, you pull it out, you wash it off, and then you apply PCR to duplicate the RNA strands. You have to convert to DNA and then you apply PCR and you convert back to RNA. And uh, you basically, you can convince yourself very quickly that you're implementing base rule with 10 to the 15 variables. And I had my scientist parties where people in my kitchen uh, uh, played around and extracted, uh, you know, the DNA from, from onions and did all these experiments. So it was interesting. So you can do this with very basic equipment that is very popular now because of, because of the COVID epidemic. Okay, so it, can, it cannot be done with a computer. Um, because you have to do three-dimensional simulations with 10 to the 15 variables, okay? Now, the 
point that I want to make here is Bayes rule is real. It happens. You can also do it in your sandbox, where instead of pulling, pushing in, pulling out, washing off, blah, you 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 use a filter, a sieve to sieve out different different types of kernels. And that would be the selection operator. Now, in the case of sand, you cannot make more of it uh, of the same type. So in PCR, you can. But the question is, what about this one? Is it real? Is there a physical experiment that updates this way? Is there a physical experiment that homes into the largest eigenvalue? Can you think of one? That's, that's what I want to know. That's problem one. The second one is the general, generalized base rule always contains the conventional base rule as a hardest case. So the hardest case happens always when they are the two matrices of the same eigensystem. So, so in some sense, you learn the eigensystem for free. And we're totally fascinated by that. As a pun, we called it a free matrix lunch. Because <laughs> there is a paper out there that says, you know, there's no free lunch in machine learning. Uh, every algorithm uh, has some advantages and disadvantages. There's no free lunch. You, when you pick a different algorithm, you win in some areas, but you have to lose in another area. It's a dubious paper, but it's a nice phrase. <laughs> So we, we, as a pun, we said, oh, we have the free matrix lunch. We proved certain regret bounds for certain algorithms in the matrix case. They had, and the hardest case was the diagonal case, the basic case. And we ran into a bunch of these and we're kind of fascinated. When is that free matrix lunch? Okay, anyway, we had fun as you can tell. So that's it. Yes. So th th thanks for this talk. Uh, I, I won't pretend that I was able to follow everything, but but <laughs> um, one thing that confuses me a bit about this the whole program here is so so clearly things ha happen in quantum that don't happen in standard probability, and people have exploited that for fun and profit. You know, Shaw's algorithm uses destructive interference and all, and all these things. And so it seems to me, maybe I misunderstood, that you're just trying to generalize probability calculus, kind of trying to keep as much classical behavior as possible. And so my question is, is that right? I mean, like, like what criteria do we use to decide how to generalize, basically? So you have this product that commutes. Like, do we want it to commute? It's from my background. Uh, from my background, I sort of ran into this base rule. People with different backgrounds ran into other base rule. The question is, which one is real? Uh, if you talk about something like uh, graphical models, right? Uh, like the first the talks this morning, graphical models, they use base rule and so forth. And this one fits. Whether other ones fit as well, I don't know. OK, but uh, I don't have an answer. Okay. But I would love to know what you should be looking for if you were a physicist. This experiment, you know, with a with an eigensystem. Is there an experiment where you would home into the largest eigendirection after iterating? That's what I would look for. Some kind of a physical experiment. Okay. Thank you. I don't know whether it exists. I'm very fascinated by it though, because I mean, this is only the beginning. Trust me, there's lots of beautiful calculus there that makes things work. So, and it looks like information theory, it looks like Cover's book, except lift it to the density matrix case. I can do mutual information. I could, you know, I could continue. Can I ask, do the other Bayes rules have a similar interpretation that something converges in the way that the maximum eigenvalue seems to converge here? Or is that? Yes, I would say so. 
I mean, it's this, it's this where you, you know, these are your models and then you home into the largest and then this is the generalization. But I mean, in the other, you said there were alternative Bayes rules and you showed a couple on the calculus slide. Uh, th those are, yes, uh, those are just sort of different questions, but they use the same, same kind of thinking uh, in, the, in this. Uh, they are not different. They are of the type that we discussed, that we found. They're all sort of relative entropy motivated, but they are, other people have looked at Bayes rule, defined Bayes rule in the quantum context, and they came up with totally different answers, which I don't recall right now. But back then I read a bunch of them and they didn't make much sense to me. Thanks. Other questions? This is a, a slightly impressionistic question. Yes. Um, you mentioned, in, you know, if you use the kind of von Neumann formalization for quantum yeah. mechanics, you you collapse and, and you just go to an eigenstate, right? And you throw away the rest of it. And you were saying you don't throw away the rest of it, right? Well, if you but, run, if you run, let me see, if you run this for a very long time, you end up with one state. Right. But the, the I mean, I mean, the question I, you 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 said that there's a you get an equal result by taking a limit as n goes to infinity of taking essentially milder and milder transformations, right? And iterating them when you when you define your circle dot thing. That's just a different and, way to define one update. Step. Yeah, but I'm, I'm but in in quantum mechanics, it seems to me that's the analog of what's called the quantum Zeno effect. Which if you're using if you're using the von Neumann collapse rule, and you try and 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 get to a large transformation by a series of small transformations, it doesn't work. You get stuck. Because you're throwing away the other stuff, right? It's it's the watch pot, watch pot um, um, paradox. That if you if you if you observe it too closely and you're modeling the observations by von Neumann collapses, you don't get the result of a of a large thing by a series of small things. It gets stuck. So is that? I mean, you is it that you're not getting that because you're not throwing stuff away? I mean, there's maybe, essentially no maybe. real collapse. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Yeah, so, so yes, yeah, that kind of thinking is interesting, yeah. The questions? Uh, I have a small question. I sure. mean, I just like your picture. I just, can you just remind us how, how you draw the matrix that looks like an eight? What, what does that mean? If you look at their funny product definition, there's a bunch of those. You mean this one, the eight? The, yeah, if it go, go. Yeah, okay, that's here. Yeah, yeah, something like we that. We plotted these with MATLAB and Maple. Uh, so what I did here is, here's the unit direction. This is the density matrix. And then I plotted the trace of uh, C U U transpose in the direction of U. So I plotted this, this length is this. Oh, I see, I see. So this would be the probability assigned to that state as I look at all possible directions. Yeah, gotcha. And then it looks like this. Other questions? All right, let's thank the speaker. Thank you.